Now, what a week it's been in Melbourne town. My God, people arrested. Demonstrations continued yesterday, I think, at Northcote. I think the police intervened early, but through the week, some of those scenes, my God. Police say they will continue to arrest and fine anybody attending further unlawful protests. Tim Smith is the member for Q in Victoria. You've probably heard me speak to Tim before. He's a Shadow Attorney General, Shadow Minister for Finance and Shadow Minister for COVID Recovery. There's a bunch of things to keep you busy. He's joined the chorus of disappointment at these protests, particularly that right, that disgraceful behaviour at the Shrine. I thought we'd have a chat. He's on the line. Mr Smith, are you well? Luke, I'm very well. How are you, sir? I'm, I'm travelling just fine. Thank you, Tim. But uh, as, I, as I look at Melbourne from uh, the comfort of, well, perhaps not so comfort of where I am, it was a terrible, terrible week. Those scenes uh, around the shrine were just awful, but um, it's almost like the government lost a bit of control. I think it's the weirdest week in what has been uh, a very weird 18 months. To be really frank with you, I have never seen Melbourne so divided, so bitter, so angry, so um, stressed. Uh, The anxiety levels amongst our citizens are going through the roof. And it all started last Sunday when Daniel Andrews announced his roadmap to nowhere that really did break the hearts of literally millions of Victorians where basically he said that we weren't getting any discernible improvement in our freedoms until well into November, well behind what's happening in New South Wales. I mean, to put it bluntly, the 70% double jab mark in Victoria is essentially being ignored. That's, that's the long and the short of it. We still have a travel limit, a travel band of 25 kilometres at the 70% double jab mark, uh, which, of course, in New South Wales doesn't exist. Yeah. We still have a curfew. We're going to be under hard lockdown for another five weeks with a curfew and all the other bells and whistles that come with living in Victoria under Daniel Andrews. Then on Monday, um, 500 CFMEU members protested out the front of the CFMEU because Daniel Andrews literally, without any consultation, brought in a vaccine mandate for the construction sector that they had to undertake by the Thursday of this week which was never going to happen. So uh, on the Tuesday, after Daniel Andrews announced on the Monday night that the construction sector would be unilaterally closed down because of the protests of a few hundred people, 300,000 workers in the construction sector, not just downtown uh, big building sites, but tradies and builders and chippies in the suburbs told you're on you're on the couch for two weeks so quite understandably there was a huge amount of distress on tuesday in melbourne Mm. so uh and this just spiraled out of control from that point on and yes initially there were people protesting who were um peaceful and were there because they had literally lost two weeks of income and were locked down and many of them were double jabbed in fact, if you assume that the construction sector in the, between the ages of, say, 20-odd and 40-odd were single-jabbed at the same rate as the rest of Victoria, 60-odd percent of the construction sector would be at least single-jabbed. That would be about 180,000 people. Well, why couldn't they go back to work? But then we get to the really ugly parts of the week where you saw the CFMEU literally take over the CBD of Melbourne march up to the Westgate Bridge. And anyone that knows Melbourne knows that if you block off the Westgate Bridge, you shut down Melbourne. Mm. The CFMEU shut down Melbourne. And then on Thursday, a ragtag bunch of construction workers and other peanuts, (laughs) and I'll call them that, uh, then decided that they would protest at the shrine and defile the shrine, which was the most despicable thing, frankly, I think I've ever seen, Mm. which ensured that any sympathy for these protesters anyone might have had at the start of the week evaporated on the spot on Thursday. There was uh, an effort I know by uh, particularly the Victorian government and other um, Labor identities, perhaps federal politicians, to suggest that they weren't really unionists. These were the renter crowd types. 
Now, I've seen some footage from both, and I've seen people interviewed from earlier in the week, I should say, and they were proud to say they were members of the CFMEU. Do you, do you accept that some of those people protesting were, in fact, just uh, rent-a-crowd types that, or anti-vaxxers, that because there was a protest they had to be involved? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that the CFMEU were the dominant force behind the protests. No doubt in my mind whatsoever. Whether or not the CFMEU leadership was involved, I have no idea. But the on-the-ground protesters were absolutely members of the CFMEU. And that has been, um, that has been verified by multiple sources, both on the ground, in the media, and from the Labor movement. I don't care what the, the ACTU or any federal Labor politician tries to spin... It was the CFMEU, and as Ben Schneiders in The Age wrote quite brilliantly earlier this week, that there is a hard-right faction within the CFMEU. And, you know, you just have to have a little bit of nuance in your understanding of the union movement in Melbourne to know that, which a lot of these commentators in the ABC and other parts of the country have no idea about, to be frank. Mm. But as the week wore on, it would be fair to say that the construction workers went home and a strange group of anti-vaxxers and other um, odd bods joined the fray. And uh, that was, I think, the majority of the people yeah. that ended up and who were, uh, who were you know, arrested in you know, suburban parks in Northcote today, for example. Yeah. What, what's the way out of this? What's the way out of this? The way out of this is for Daniel Andrews to give people some hope, to consult with industry, if you're going to bring in draconian rules overnight, um, consult with industry, consult with members. You know, look, look at the difference between New South Wales and Victoria in the construction industry. New South Wales have had some pretty tough rules with regards to, const- to the construction industry. They said that building sites with unvaccinated workers could only be at 50% capacity. That's a pretty strong message to the sector that the government wants you to get vaccinated mm. without using a sledgehammer. Mm. But in Victoria, no, Chairman Dan uses a sledgehammer and look at the result. So the construction sector returns to very, no, not quite back to normal, but getting back to normal on Monday. There are still 12 LGAs where uh, uh, workers will have to be vaccinated if they're going to be on site. But by and large, construction is going to get back to some sort of normality in Sydney on Monday. In Victoria, they're locked down for two weeks. Well, this is not sustainable. Mm. Uh, the construction sector is vital to Victoria's economy. And equally, Daniel Andrews' roadmap, the curfews, the lack of hope. You know, we, still, we have a curfew tomorrow night and our grand final's being played in Perth. You know, <laughs> we want some family time. We want some time with friends and family just to watch the grand final, which we're being denied yet again. Yeah. So we want to give people hope. We want to give people hope. We want to give people an opportunity that, uh, to think about not just more lockdowns, but a future that can get Victoria back to normal, back on track, back with family, back with friends, back growing again. And at the moment, Daniel Andrews is just giving his doom and gloom. Yeah, um, too easy for some of these leaders just to say no to everything and shut everything. It's actually, I think, uh, far more a challenge to find a way to get things or keep things going. And I think, I know she's got her critics, but I think Bera Jicklian's done that uh, from time to time through all of this. Can I just touch on a, a few other issues? The earthquake on Wednesday, it would have been interesting had there been further widespread damage requiring uh, chippies, tradies, plasterers and the like, and they were told they couldn't work. Whoa. Where were you when the earthquake struck and did you feel it? Didn't feel a thing. I was in my car driving from my electric office in Kew to Parliament House. So uh, I didn't feel a thing. I did notice as I was driving to Parliament House that there were a lot of people out in the streets and I couldn't work out what had occurred. And then I turned on the radio and there was 3AW saying that uh, there'd been an earthquake. Yeah. So um, I wasn't particularly useful on those matters, but the, the simple fact was that what was a very weird week got even weirder with an earthquake in the middle of Melbourne. You, you didn't allow to allow yourself to think that all the people on the street were there cheering you on your way to Parliament? Not at all. You sure? I would never, you I sure? Would never have the, I would never have these thoughts. 
Okay. I'll never have these thoughts, Luke. Not at all. Right. Um, John Elliott, a, a giant, uh, a, a brilliant, a big Australian character, and I'm sure over the journey you would have bumped into him more than once. What are your memories of the man? John Elliott was a a huge figure in the Liberal Party in the 1980s and the 1990s. I mean, he made a he made a significant contribution to the election of the Kennett government in Victoria in 1992. He made a significant contribution to the election of the Howard government in 1996. Uh, look, he was part and parcel of Melbourne. My grandfather was a massive Carlton supporter. John Elliott was the president of the Carlton Football Club from 1983 to 2002. Uh, I think I met him when I was a kid at the football with my grandfather a couple of times, to be frank. Uh, look, he was just one of these, you know, on one side of the fence, a larrikin, on the other side of the fence, obnoxious, depending on how you viewed the man. Hmm. I thought he was quite hilarious. I remember when I was a kid, he lit up a cigarette on the footy show. Yes. And Sam Newman, Sam Newman was, thought it was hilarious, and Eddie had a heart attack. That's right. Uh, I, remember it, yeah. I remember it vividly. It was absolutely hysterical. Yeah, uh, and you, you, people don't do that anymore. I mean, I, I think our country's the poorer for it because it's funny, mm. and I think the woke crowd and the politically correct crowd, you know, they really have made the place a lot more boring than what it once was. I agree entirely. Now the grand final, who wins it? Well, I'm a Melbourne supporter, so go D's. I'm one and too. Oh, you are too. That's right. Yes. What a, about that. I, I see. I don't have the the pedigree you have. I haven't. I, I'm a bit of a Johnny come lately. I've been a member for ten years. Uh, you've probably gone for them forever. And uh, I remember when we were working together briefly in Melbourne. It was never. It was never great news. You didn't avoid talking about it, but um, it, it wasn't front of mind. But haven't they been sensational this season? Well, they've been absolutely tremendous. And I, the reason why I think they're going to win. Because it's such a typically Melbourne football club thing to do to win your first premiership in 57 years and have the grand final in Perth. <laughs> <laughs> like it's just, that's just so profoundly Melbourne football club. Right. You know, the grand final's been in Melbourne for 150 years, save <laughs> for two. <laughs> and we, we're going to win the one in Perth. So that's, my, <laughs> that's why I think we're going to win. All right, mate. Love to chat. Stay well. Thanks, Luke. All the best. You too, mate. Tim Smith.